This is the Biz of Wealth. Challenges, rumblings, and evolution of the wealth management industry. Welcome to the Business of Wealth. Today I have the pleasure of talking to Richard Kahn. Richard is Managing Director at Sigma Analysis and Management, where he's heading efforts towards product development and business development. Prior to this, he co-founded Emerging Global Advisors, a New York-based fund company managing ETFs focused on providing exposures to emerging and frontier markets that was sold to Columbia Threadneedle, the investment arm of Ameriprise Financial, in 2016. Over his 25 years of buy-side experience, Richard has held senior roles at a traditional investment consulting firm, as well as at a hedge fund index provider and ETF issuer manager, most often as a co-founder and chief investment officer. While in New York, Richard taught the fundamentals of portfolio management course at NYU, and his current professional interests include alternative investments and their intersection with innovations related to data and fields such as AI and machine learning. In this discussion, we had a lot of fun talking about his early days as well as his view of the markets for the future. So without much further ado, welcome Richard. Richard, welcome to the Business of Wealth. Thanks for having me over. My pleasure. So as you know, we start these interviews with what got you here and what's here, in your mm -hmm. words. Yeah, so um, fresh out of school uh, with a degree in math, with not a lot of real application in real life. The uh, kind of stuff I was studying was like billiard tables in two dimension and then three dimension and maybe in time four dimensions. Uh, that has some application in uh, the energy department with splitting atoms, that sort of thing, but uh, not, not a lot more beyond that in terms of job prospects. In the 1990s, it uh, was a tough time to look for a job because of the recession there. But I was pretty lucky that I met someone who said, I saw some kind of um, competition that you were involved with. Uh, I think it had something to do with programming. He said, if you don't mind, take a look at this data and uh, come back to me in a week and tell me what you think. So I got a group of guys from school um, who had also just uh, recently graduated. And we had our own little sort of hackathon where I said, look, there's this data here. Um, let's see what this is. And <clears throat> I came back to the guy a week later and said, yeah, there's some pattern here. I have no idea what's going on, but whatever is happening, it's going to keep going in this general direction, which is basically upwards. These numbers are just going to keep going upwards. And that was basically um, energy prices, right? And somewhere in the uh, early mid, mid 90s. So we said, okay, um, explain. And so I explained, uh, we did it. And uh, I basically got my first job uh, at what was a one man hedge fund. Uh, I guess I was employee number one. And uh, we started to uh, get clients from the big banks, uh, essentially their proprietary uh, money. And uh, I don't think I focus so much now, thinking back at the time on what I learned about the markets and investing, I really learned how to be an entrepreneur, a small business, building the brand, uh, client relationships, but also the uncertainties of that time, which was um, very uncertain regulation, right? The OSC is very clear now, it's a, it's a, very, it's a very big machine, and um, the rules are, are well written, and they have surveys, and they have guidance. At that time, this was very different. So the operational risk was actually quite high for, for a smaller firm. So I, I learned quite a lot at that time. I, I, from there, I went to wealth management, and I started to play a discretionary role, um, the discretionary shop using ETFs. That got me so interested that sort of flipped me in New York to become an issuer, um, sold that business, came back to Toronto, um, started to dabble in fintech startups, uh, a VC accelerator in Asia, and then now I'm back in the hedge fund and alternative investment space in Toronto, right where I started. I like it because it's basically um, the early days of hackathons and startups and incubators without calling them all that, and, al and algorithms too, right? Yeah, and actually at that time, it's, it's a time of a different generation. You know, tech, there was no internet in the mid 90s. Well, there was, but not like what we know in terms of Google searches and that sort of, I, that's what I call, I guess, pre-Google. 
such a term. Um, but there was very little incentive for anyone graduating in the 90s to think of a Mark Zuckerberg or, or any sort of startup. It just wasn't part of our mentality. The dream you were in business school was to work for Goldman Sachs or McKinsey. Um, if you were coming out of Waterloo Math or computers like, like I was, then you want to work at Microsoft or Nortel, just a big company and a safe job. We're, we're from that generation, but we've had to adapt, obviously, in the 20 world. Yeah, how much has changed, right? Now everybody just wants their own stardom through entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'd like to ask how your parents describe what you do for a living because I'd like to say, I'd like to dare my interviewees to say in very simple words what they do. Because generally their parents yeah. do everything, right? <laughs> yeah. It was never easy. <clears throat> so um, my parents are in the science and or science and medical space. Um, so for them, compounding of interest is about as far as they went in terms of financial literacy, <clears throat> right? They, they were never one to be in the stock market or anything like that. Um, luckily for them, when one day, I guess in the 60s or something, somebody said, hey, do you want to join this pension plan? They both said yes, right? And luckily, the, these DB plans uh, sort of akin to Ontario teachers or hoops, it's something that they're part of. Um, and so good for them, right? They didn't have to have financial knowledge because they had, I guess, this safety net for them beyond Canada pension and all of security. They had this, this government plan, which is very good. But when I explained to them, this is what I do, um, as, as educated as they, as they are or were, it's, it's just, it was never easy. So at the end, I just said, look, I try to make big piles of money bigger. And I sort of start from there. But if I were to talk about alternative investments or ETFs, they, they can get it. It's just, they just don't have the interest to, to want to get it. Um, but I, I did tell them one thing, however, <clears throat> which is you may have thought of this space as something completely foreign of people in a different world who study accounting and go to business school. But you ought to know that the education of uh, mine, which focused more on math, computers, physics, these sort of quantitative fields is actually the future of many industries, including financial services. They, that took a while for them to get, but um, they, they eventually got it. And so they said, okay, that even complicates things more because I thought it was just simply, you know, is this company worth it? Looking at an annual right. report or something. It's, it's the stock market <laughs> go up and down and- Yeah. Yeah, not anymore. No, but to them, I don't want to say that they equate it to witchcraft, but it's something that they, they just don't get. They just, they just don't get. Actually, I was talking to an advisor the other day that gave me amazing returns, and I was, uh, I was actually working on something for him at that point, and I was like, oh my God, you're like a witch. He just, you know, he saw I was working on this, and he sent me this message, and he's like, well, don't, you know, don't discard it, you know, <laughs> sort of. Sometimes what I feel I'm doing, you know, portfolio management and witchcraft. Yeah. Um, it was a it was a funny and thought provoking, uh, actually, idea. Uh, yeah. Actually, my dad said something one time. He said, <clears throat> "Look, um, you're a doctor. You have a certain license, and you sign off on something. You take this drug. You should have this operation, or whatever it might be." But the the reality is that a lot of people have this point of view of doctors, which is they they. They seem like they know what they're doing, but the reality is that it's still a statistical problem, right? If we operate on you or you take this drug, it may not work out. There could be a side effect from the drug. You, you know, who knows what happens, right? There's still a potential for, for suffering or pain or whatever it might be. If you're a lawyer, there's no guarantee that we're going to get the outcome we want from this judge or jury, whatever. And it's the same with us. Give us money. We have a fiduciary duty. There is it. And so my father always said to me, uh, I sometimes equate what you do to this uncertain thing that could be gambling or like lottery tickets. I really have no idea how you determine if things is going to go up or down. Um, but it's the same thing in our fields too. There's, there's never a certainty that your body's going to behave the way that we thought, right? Because when you open your, the body in first year uh, medical school, it's a healthy body. And then second year, you open it up and it's like a dirty body or a sick body. But everyone's sick a different way. So there's no certainty that this, uh, this plan is going to work. And I said, thank you for understanding that this is not only hard to, to figure out, but there's like a lot of uncertainty in, in our world too. 
then obviously there is. It comes to that. That's super interesting because I was going to ask you where you see the industry going. And you know, asset management used to be uh, the you know the product for the elites. You know, that you, know, you have enough money, let me manage it for for you. But more and more, we have products coming out to the market thanks to you know the the technology that makes it for the masses and makes it possible for you to manage multiple like millions of accounts at the same time that um basically how are we going you know where where do you see the industry going there it's it feels like you we are democratizing we're making it available for the masses what are the risks that the industry is taking there yeah <clears throat> so there are certain things with technology where you either have an easier time of doing things or it's cheaper or faster <clears throat> or in some ways it's just better or, or more optimal <clears throat> so that might be shopping right so you go to costco and you can pretty much get everything and dump it into your suv and you're done for the next three weeks or a month or get the rest of it on amazon prime they'll just deliver it to you that's kind of an easy one but when there is risk like your money or your body, we have to kind of work, think about it. So the future of medical, anything, medical tech, could we really have a conversation like this, you're my doctor, and you say, okay, here's what I prescribe, go to that government-sponsored vending machine, swipe your OHIP card, or you know, or whatever, we're not sure, we have a, obviously a universal plan, but you, you swipe that card and out comes some bottle of drugs, right? And then you swipe your MasterCard. There's a lot of risks in that, right? You can actually, you know, check if my arm's working or, or, or look down my throat or whatever it might be. <clears throat> so this is the same thing with the robo-advisor, right? Yes, it's faster. You can onboard somebody in two minutes by answering a few questions, but do you really know the person by answering those few questions? Um, you're going to use, I don't know, six or seven ETFs out of, you know, I don't know how many ETFs are out there, so many now, but is it really customized for that individual and for all these individual individuals aged from, I don't know, 16 to 90 or, or something with their various income requirements and very specific, um, somewhat, you know, could, could be idiosyncratic kind of um, requirements. I, I could have triplets going to university next year or, or, or some other weird situation. Uh, this is the problem is that, yes, we're pushing the limits of um, technology and we ought to, especially for cost, especially for education get people engaged to kind of want to know how to this because it's easier well, I want to know how I'm performing or how, how the stock market works. That's all fine, right? Um, and we're in a data heavy world. So the more we can get data and use it in a smart way to understand maybe this group, Gen Z versus boomers, um, and their needs and how they operate with a, with a utensil like a tablet, great. But to say that we can truly customize for everybody in something that looks and feels like a robo-advisor, we have to be careful about that because when something bad happens, like February or March of this year, they're not gonna call a robot, they're gonna call a human being to get comfort. And the comfort comes from the fact that we really knew them, KYC, right? Um, we really understood their situation and the suitability of the portfolio. And I, I just wonder, um, are we really there yet? Is it, is it enough of really getting our fiduciary duty um, right? The standard of care. So for, you, if it's, yeah. for you, the fiduciary duty is all about personalization of the strategy. No, no. This fiduciary duty, according to the textbook, is having a certain level of care for someone as a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant or a fund manager. I should know your situation. And because I have some education and um, sort of regulatory approval or licensing, I'm going to, to do something for it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna conduct some surgery, or I'm gonna build a portfolio, whatever it might be. The robo-advisor um, can be challenged during stressful times when someone will say, that's not exactly what I wanted, or that was not the outcome that I thought I would get. And that simply in, in sort of layman terms comes back to you get what you paid for. Right. And so, that the case with all products? Uh, well, we have moved from a psychology in um, the world today where after 
Y2K and after the financial crisis, investors just simply said, there's, things are actually not that bad. And we had after Y2K, a six or seven year bull run after March, 2009 and the financial crisis, a 10 and a half year bull run. And despite fiscal cliffs and all kinds of crazy stuff, we were uh, essentially conditioned to just buy and, and buy almost anything. That's why ETFs have become so popular. Yeah. So is there wow. value? Is, the question is, is there value now in active management? Because we've just been using ETFs for, for so many people and hedge funds have just not been able to perform as well because the markets have been so strong. It, it was pointless to be trying to you know, outsmart the market. You better, better just be the market. Right. So the question is, as a fiduciary duty, a fidu as a fiduciary, you're supposed to provide guidance to someone who's, who's a layman. But the real strategy that work has worked is simply set it and forget it. That's not true during the financial crisis. It's not true during COVID-19. And it may not be true for the next couple of years as we try to figure out, you know, 20 percent unemployment in the U.S. When I don't know what was the unemployment during the financial crisis, maybe half of that. Yeah. Right. So even if we do fix things, are, are we in a good space? No, we're not. Right. We're really not. And so I think investors have to say buying on the dip worked during the climb up after Y2K and the climb up after the financial crisis. But let's reconsider if that's the thing to do now. Let's not be lazy. Let's really figure out what we need to do. And this is not just for retail. This is also big asset owners having to figure out if, if they're expected return targets if there are um, future obligations, is there a mismatch based on the world that we're in today? But in terms of, if I am an asset manager, you are one, how do you reposition your product? You were having, you know, an easy, you know, run because every single product launched worked. How do you reposition it? And how do you tell your client that that's what you're doing? Where, you know, which asset managers do you see winning um in in this you know in these markets well <clears throat> certainly you know who are the big behemoths in the asset management space now not asset owners but the producers of new product it's who are the big three blackrock vanguard state street um i don't know maybe charles schwab they're all big passive index producers or, or etf shops right and then the rest of them uh, you know, any of the big 10 ETF issuers in the US, they're, they're all behemoths. So because they have brand and they have a history over the last 10, 20 years of just accumulating assets, uh, no matter what happens, they'll be fine. And actually, if you look at uh, robo advisors and many financial advisors, so both sort of tech focused and human, they're gonna bias towards those because just like no one ever got fired for, you, for uh, partnering with IBM, no one's ever gonna get fired probably for using an ETF from Vanguard or, or BlackRock, that's perfectly fine. The question is, are they going to be actively using that during a time where we are not sure, again, like after Y2K and the financial crisis, that we'll have a nice sharp rebound in 10 years of smooth sailing. If we are in a very different world, then maybe ETS can still be popular and they're highly liquid, right? They're, and their underlying are presumably super liquid. So trading them is not gonna be an issue. So we might be in a, in a world where we're still ETF friendly, but not buy hold time uh, holding periods might be shorter. So that's, that's one aspect. We might also be looking at a world where people have to change other dimensions. You know, financial crisis, we should be not so overweight in financials like we were. The last three or four years, we've been so overweighted in tech, maybe a specific kind of tech, like, tech, like online Netflix or Amazon. Um, now I'm wondering if we've forgotten about country bias, right, or regional bias. So people say, no, it's really, you really need to get the sector right. Yeah, but in a COVID-19 world where um, a Singapore or a, or a Taiwan are doing well, but in Italy and a Spain and now Brazil are not doing so well, maybe country bias is not a bad idea, not to determine who to invest you, but who to kind of sort of reduce your exposure to because their economy is now shut down, borders are closed, whatever it might be, right? So um, I think a lot of investors will have to reconfigure their their way of thinking and which factors they care about more. Okay. And how will, you know, which are the, the financial companies and the asset managers and financial advisors that will fail in the coming years? What do you think? 
Well, <clears throat> again, brand is very big. Um, when you look at uh, like Apple, it's not a tech company, it's, it's, a, it's a product. Um, it's a consumer company. And ETFs are very much like that. People don't look at them and say, oh, I understand how ETF works. They, they look at the ticker symbol just like Ford. It's, it's just the Ford F-150. This is SPY. It's just something that they can just buy and sell very easily. They have a product mentality. So that's fine. Uh, but the ones that will not do well, I think are the ones who have not really articulated um, the idea that there's an expectation you have. And I'm not sure if that expectation is right today because something is different now, right? So there is great social unrest, um, inequality in the US. There is this difference in response to a pandemic. There is something definitely going wrong with, with oil pricing. Um, there's expectations of inflation, but you're not so sure. So people look at gold or Bitcoin. There's all these different strings being pulled in different directions. And I think whether you're a financial advisor or a fund producer, I think you really have to say, um, what is it that we do really well? Low cost, low performance, whatever it might be. Um, can't be everything to everyone. But right now, building a brand where someone will say, this is the go-to place for responsible investing because social is such a big deal now with inequality in the right. US. Yeah. Who is that brand name right now in, in social or ESG? Nobody. Nobody shouted out in you know, a Grand Central Station, who is the ESG champion out there? No one would, no one would raise up their hands. That's them, right? Nobody. Like, what's the soft drink that everyone knows about Coca-Cola, right? Where can you get movies cheap? Netflix. But this area? Where can you invest? No. Yeah, where can you invest <clears throat> socially responsibly? No. But if you say, where's the place to go to ETFs? No problem. iShares, Vanguard, State Street. Like, that's an easy one. But... I'm not sure if buy, hold ETFs like we've seen in the past, at least for the next two or three years, I'm very uncertain of that. I think hedge funds, um, and you, you know, who, who may not do well, here's the thing. Hedge funds, so many of them did not do well over the last 10 years since March 2009 because they were going against a big headwind, which was just a strong equity market. <clears throat> or just, just broadly, everything was doing very well. If they don't really outperform, whether in aggregate or individually, when would they outperform? This is the time mm -hmm. to outperform during this time of uncertainty, yeah. right? So they better, and then the tools of the trade, right? Blowing up a financial statement and trying to figure out where are there are any inefficiencies, CFA level two kind of stuff, perfectly fine. But the use of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the new world of data, new alternative data sources. This has yet to be proven. People are talking about Renaissance technologies or um, Two Sigma in certain places, fine, right, great. But you can't invest there anymore unless you're an employee or something in certain cases. So where else can you go? This is yet to be um, still early. These are places that they ought to get it right. I was going to ask you about, you know, what's missing in the marketplace. And I like the idea you just said, you know, nobody's grabbing the ESG space. Nobody's really owning that. Mm -hmm. So if you were to launch, let's say, tomorrow, and, you know, ESG-focused asset management firm, how would you do it? You know, what do you, what do you focus on? And how do you, <coughs> how do you reach clients? And make them aware that, you know, I actually have, you know, I can think of a million ways to reach them, but changing financial advisors is um, the biggest hurdle all as a manager face. You know, trying to get a client from somebody else is almost impossible sometimes. Yeah. So how do you do that? Okay, <clears throat> so we know that a lot of asset owners um, especially in Northern Europe, Canada, <clears throat> Australia, even in the US, are very biased towards responsible investing. Mm -hmm. Many of the cases, it's a, a DB plan that is um, representative of a large, <clears throat> like teachers or government employees. And I don't want to generalize, but in many cases, they are a little bit more liberal thinking. But it, I don't want to say left, leftist, but they're just of, of that sort, <clears throat> just perfectly fine. 
which means that, uh, again, a generalization, but they might be more uh, vocal in their feelings about the environment and global warming, <clears throat> about social justice, that sort of thing. And it's perfect. And that's, that's not to say that someone who might be more right-wing or fiscal conservative isn't good for them. That's not, <clears throat> that's not what I'm getting at. What I am getting at is that they are already down this path to build a highly um, responsible, sustainable ESG-oriented portfolio. That, that's already <clears throat> a given. And their approach is uh, correct. It's not an asset class or just a piece of the overall pie. It's like a philosophy that permeates through the whole organization. It's culture, uh, almost like a religion. It just encompasses everything about them, including their portfolio. For the rest of the world that is not an asset owner, <clears throat> they're still thinking, uh, because they have no um, supporters like a union to say, you know, we believe in this, so this is what we should do. This is the individual person who may not believe in the same thing <clears throat> as, as the group. And so they might care about global warming, but they don't care as much about you know, some governance issue. The, the question really is, is, is the mentality of this non-asset owner that if I were to get into responsible investing or anything other than what I've done in the past, it's going to degrade my returns or ruin my performance because I'm too busy trying to save the world or fight for social justice that my actual returns, my investment, my retirement fund will not be as, as good. And so that's the problem, that first step. And I think a lot of advisors need to get it into their head that this is a way to differentiate themselves from other advisors because this younger millennial and Gen Z um, generation certainly care about this. Well, definitely. Like you know, every, you know, every single study shows that millennials, which are you know, just in line now to you know, uh, inherit everything from the boomers, are the ones that started the trend of taking a look at what the companies are doing before even buying from them. You know, Tom's, the, the shoes were you know, one of the first examples, but everybody's following behind. So I don't, I don't get why the financial services industry is not. Um, you know, they, they do some campaigns, you see, here and there, you know, we, we care socially, but really like falling behind that and investing, you know, putting your money where your, your, your mouth is. <laughs> no, yeah, you, you asked me the question, if I were to do it, <clears throat> where would I focus? <clears throat> My sense is, is it's the data. So either at the company yeah. level, really digging into the data that they have in terms of how much they pollute the world or uh, how much minority representation they have there or whatever it might be. Because if you don't have data that really refines the process, how ESG or how responsible will this investment portfolio be? It may look like the S&P 500, except with slightly different weightings, but actually if you create an ESG ETF for the US equity market, and then you look at the S&P 500 and then you plot the lines, they're incredibly high, you know, highly correlated or almost on top of each other, then someone might say, really? Like, where is the value of this? I just paid, instead of a, a very low cost S&P 500 fund that, I don't know, five basis points, I paid 25 basis points because it's, it has an ESG slapped on it. So I think what, I'm, I'm not suggesting that you have to be digging when the market is zagging, that's not what I'm saying, but there has to be um, quantitative evidence that this is as pure an ESG portfolio that can be made and justifiably say, here, here are the factors that we look at that make this a more responsible portfolio than this. Mm. Yeah, makes total sense. So going back to technology, um, in asset management, we know, you know the industry is way behind uh, in the adoption of every single technology. But um, the main question you always get asked is, how do you integrate it with the much needed human touch, the much needed relationship building that we have to do in asset management before we can get you know, a client on board? Um, for you, what would be the ideal combination and how would you implement it? Okay, um, <clears throat> I think in any um, business, if you're uh, selling pharmaceuticals <clears throat> or a car or whatever it might be, there has to be this client engagement so you understand not only what product do they need now, right? So 
I've got this business and I need to haul things. Great, here's a pickup truck. I'm gonna sell you a pickup truck, right? But the, the client is also thinking about the future and the fact that the high energy cost for their fleet of pickup trucks is <clears throat> problematic. So I have to sort of hedge that, right? So what do I do? I, I, you know, this guy buys Tesla stock or whatever, <laughs> fine. But maybe this guy should be sold an electric vehicle, right? So this is the, the sort of the approach that I'm saying, which is you can use technology and it's important to low co lower cost or provide other sort of, um, sort of operational efficiency. But the human factor is really to understand you're a good fit here. Because the problem that um, Richard or Alejandro, anybody has today may not be the same problem tomorrow. I'm getting older, my kids are approaching college age or whatever it might be. And I'm not sure if that's embedded in the computer for the robo-advisor robo or whatever you have, but it's my job as a sort of um, client relationship manager, so to speak, to say, hey, client, um, it's like Bloomberg guys. They come to you all the time saying, here's the latest and greatest of what we've got. Where did that come from? It came from the fact that they checked out the market, saw what was interesting, what was needed, and you know they wanted Bitcoin analytics. Okay, so you want here, here we have it. So if you don't have that human component, oh, who's gonna figure out what the client wants as the world evolves and so does that client? That's absolutely a human being. Right. right. And then to determine if actually what we built is enough or, you know, why didn't you do that? Or why didn't you do that? Again, a human is absolutely needed for that. And if we are a static business, we don't need that. But if we are a um, thought based business, knowledge based, wisdom based business, um, we need to figure this out. Right? Yeah. And we have to be teachers as well. Educational. Or, or sort of the financial literacy component, um, something that you should take, uh, have some sort of pride in, right? Just like a doctor says, do your push-ups, reduce your sugar or whatever. You should say the same thing, which is there's a behavior that we can suggest to you. And Wall Street and has this bad aura that, that all in it for ourselves and we'll steal and kill if we have to. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. not true. It's not true. There are, there are advisors out there who are salt of the earth, good people. Um, you need them. So, yeah, well, to that point, the other day I was talking to Mike Venuto, who was saying that the financial advisor of the future is a life coach. What yes. do you think about that? That's, that's the right, that's exactly right, yeah. right? <clears throat> because um, we need, well, life coach is too broad, but <laughs> um, that person is not going to tell you um, that you need to do the plank every day to tighten your core, right? That, that's not their job. But what is the equivalent of uh, a high intensity interval training workout that you should do every morning or, or meditation, right? What, what probably is a good idea is to ask the person, do you look at your screen, your, your stock list or your portfolio every 10 minutes between 9.30 and four? Because unless you're a day trader, this is your professional life, that's probably not a good way to live. It's not, it's, not, it's not necessary, right? Because if you incentivize yourself to trade more often, reduce your um, holding period, most likely the cost of running that is going to be counterproductive, right? That is a good life coach specific to your financial predicament, right? Absolutely, Mike Nudo, Nudo is correct, right? Uh, by the way, he was very supportive of our ETF business back in New York, so he's a great guy. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so he's right. However, um, this gets back to my very initial point. Right? It's not however, it's furthermore. If we rely too much on the technology, the question I have is the fiduciary duty and do you really know your client when on a robo-advisor app, mobile app on your phone, you answer like seven questions and boom, here comes a portfolio. What Mike Finoto is saying correctly is someone more like a life coach who really knows you can not only determine that your portfolio is correct now, but can foresee what troubles might happen because I know about your, your family, your business. I, I, I can predict how things are happening. And I can see that also with the other families or whoever it is that I'm, I'm looking at, whether I'm a multifamily office or RIA or whatever. I have a hard time believing that a technology, AI, machine, or robot 
going to be able to provide that effect. Yeah, too easy, too easy. Yeah. Okay, we're going to close with a couple of uh, little more fun, uh, little quick questions. Yeah. If you could have a billboard with anything on it, what would be and why? <clears throat> I would have a billboard that scrolls through a bunch of local entrepreneurs who are starting up a business. Right? We don't need another um, burger conglomerate or a gas, you know, gas station conglomerate. That, that we don't need that. People already identify with that brand. Drink that or eat that or get your gas there. So uh, a rolling um, board that rotates every 20 seconds with um, startups in that neighborhood, that absolutely required in Tell me something that almost nobody agrees on with you, that you believe and nobody agrees on. Um, I think not many people, I think not many people believe <clears throat> that technology is something that we um, should be a little bit careful of. And maybe you've heard that in the tone of <clears throat> what I've been saying here. And I'm absolutely not ro anti-robo-advisor or anti wealth tech. Yeah. No way. <clears throat> Actually, I, I follow a lot of what's happening there and I, I believe in it. Um, what I am saying is I worry a little bit. Um, I think there was a movie called WALL-E where it was like a, a robot and then humans were out in the spaceship and they sort of lost their, their vigor. And what I, what I don't like is you don't know telephone numbers because it's all in our cell phones. We can't even remember a 10 digit number. Um, you play a, uh, an acoustic guitar and you really know what you're doing and then you switch over to an electric, electric guitar, it'll sound just as fine. You learn on an electric guitar and then switch over to an acoustic guitar, it'll sound terrible. You're not holding the strings tight enough, right? So technology as a crutch is, a, is I think, a big problem. And I think so many people are, are pro social media, pro technology, whatever, especially the younger crowd. Um, I worry about our human um, ability to really retain true skill. Right, to learn the basics. Yeah. Okay, last one. What profession would you attempt if you, you know, if you have to change, I tell you, you can't be in the financial service industry anymore. Uh, I really liked when I was teaching uh, in New York. Um, I just loved the camaraderie and the interaction with students in the classroom. Um, the, there was a time near my end there where they were pushing online teaching and I said, no way, like I'm in New York and I meet people from Brazil and Saudi Arabia and around the world. And this is just, how do you build a Rolodex like this? It's unbelievable. Um, but now that I see the changes again with technology, um, there's no way around it. Online education, way to go. I'm actually looking at how to involve myself with that because, um, it is a fun area. It's just, can we interact with just like this? Right. Uh, you know, raise your hand and all of that, except there's like 20 boxes on my screen. I don't know, but this is the future. And I think I'd like that. That would be a, an interesting uh, path. For me. That's fun. I look yeah. forward to hear from Professor Kang then. I, I don't know about Professor, just kind of like three ratchets down from that. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, Richard. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.